Daenerys Targaryen is a subject of many fan theories, some more fantastical, some more mundane. By far the most popular one among the mundane ones is Lemongate, relating to a certain discrepancy found in Dana's first chapter. She claims that she lived in Bravos in the house with the red door and had a lemon tree outside her window, but in later parts of the story we learn that due to Bravos' cold climate and geography, trees don't grow there. This has led to the creation of various theories collectively referred to as the Lemon Gate. The contents of each subset and their conclusions vary. Most assume that it means that Daenerys isn't really Daenerys Targaryen, specifically that she's not the daughter of Rayla and Aerys. So let's address the infamous Lemon Gate. <laughs> Before we start, remember that if you like my content, like, subscribe and share so that more people can see it. Make sure to click the notification button so that you never miss a new video. The House with the Red Door is mentioned in Dana's very first chapter, where she explains that it was the only place that was close to being her home. There she had her own room with a lemon tree growing outside of her window and was taken care of by Sir William Derry, a Targaryen loyalist and a man at arms in the Red Keep during Aerys' reign, who smuggled her and Viserys from Dragonstone. After Dara died, they were expelled from the house and began wandering around Essos, without a stable place to live in. The issue of the house with the red door and the fact that lemon trees do not grow in Bravos was brought up to George's attention several times. Danny remembers a lemon tree outside the house with the red door in Bravos, but citrus trees shouldn't really grow in Bravos' cold, foggy climate. Is this discrepancy significant? Does it point to future revelations about Danny's past? Very perceptive of you. Yes, it does point to... well, that would be telling. How old was Daenerys when she left the house with the red door? Was it located close to the palace of the Sea Lord of Bravos? That's an interesting question, but I don't think I'm going to answer it. There's a certain revelation about the red door that will come into the books that I have yet to write, so we'll keep an eye on it. For example, when asked how old was Daenerys when she left the house with the red door, he said keep reading, and added that the door is not just a memory of Daenerys' happy childhood. There will be a lot more about these doors in the Winds of Winter. That naturally made fans speculate. Many different theories fall under the broad umbrella of Lemongate and each have a common denominator. The house with the red door was not in Bravos because trees don't grow in Bravos, much less lemon trees, since they need a warm climate to bear fruit, while Bravos is cold and foggy. The conclusion to these propositions is usually that Daenerys isn't who we think she is. Isaiah of Fandom loves their secret parentage theories, so when opportunity arose, the discrepancy between Dana's memory and the geography of Bravos was a perfect opportunity to devise such theories for Dani. Let's go over some of the most popular candidates. Dana is Ashara's daughter. Ashara Dane is first brought up in the context of Jon Snow's parentage. When Caitlin hears gossip in Winterfell about Ashara being Jon's mother, she confronts Ned about it. He neither denies nor confirms it, but reacts very strongly, especially for someone who's usually quite mild-mannered. We later learn that Ashara was involved with Brandon or Ned during the tourney in Harrenhal and that by the end of the rebellion she gave birth to a stillborn daughter. Afterwards, she committed suicide, jumping from the tower in Starfall. The reasons for her decision vary depending on who you ask. Some say she simply had a broken heart. Some say she did this out of grief for her brother. Arthur Dane, who died in the Tower of Joy. Some say it was due to agony of losing her daughter. But Cersei accuses Ned of causing her death by taking her child away from her. She obviously references Jon Snow and the rumors of Ashara being his mother, but could it be that this stillborn daughter was not actually stillborn, but it was Daenerys? After all, Baristan, who loved Ashara Dane, says that Dany has eyes similar to hers. The mysterious origin of House Dane and them possessing Valerian features, in spite of not being Valerians, are certainly puzzling. That theory has some glaring holes though. 
Ashara Dane did have purple eyes, but black hair, and Ned and Brandon both had grey eyes and dark hair. While genetics do not work the way they do in our world, it will be close to impossible for Danny to be born with silver hair and purple eyes from an onion of a Stark and a Dane. However, we do know of at least two Danes that have more Valyrian features. Edric Dane and Gerald Dane. Edric has pale blonde hair and dark blue eyes that appear purple, while Gerald has silver hair with a black streak. So if Ashara had a grandparent with those features, then convenient genetics could do their trick here. The genetics can be explained, but what can't be explained is Ned's actions in case Danny is his or Brandon's daughter. Ned was ready to take John to Winterfell and pretend that he is his bastard son in order to protect him from Robert's wrath. If he was willing to do this for Lyanna's son, why not help Brandon's daughter? And in Danny's case, if she is a Dane and not a Targaryen, Robert's wrath does not endanger her. Why send her into exile then? If Danny is Ashara's daughter, she can remain in Starfall and grow up there as an acknowledged bastard. She can also be fostered by one of Ned's bannermen in the north. And even if neither of those are an option and Danny is sent into exile, then why did Ned not do anything to ensure her safety? House Stark certainly has enough money for Ned to ask someone in Essos to foster Danny. While at first Danny and Viserys had a place to live, they were quickly chased away and became homeless. Shouldn't Ned do something to alleviate this, find them another place to stay? And why even let Viserys, a little kid, be Danny's sole legal guardian, especially if she is not really his sister and in spite of rumors of Viserys' madness? Why would Viserys agree to pretend that Ashara's bastard daughter is his sister, Daenerys Targaryen? All of this makes even less sense if we assume that Ned is the father, which is actually more likely than Brandon. If she is his own daughter, then the likelihood of him agreeing to send her into exile and take no interest in her well-being is even stranger. His reaction to Robert sending assassins her way should be way stronger as well, and he should make more efforts to save his own daughter. Even if he has to keep his face straight, we have his point of view and we should see stronger internal turmoil. Unless he just doesn't care, but that seems out of character for someone like Ned, especially since he probably genuinely loved Ashara. What would ultimately convince Robert to not send assassins is him at least alluding that Danny isn't really a Targaryen. Lastly, but most importantly, let us apply Ockham's razor. What would be the reason for this entire convoluted plot? The Danes have thus far very little presence in this story, and it seems like the hype around their mystery far outweighs their narrative importance. What would be the significance of Danny actually being Ashara's daughter? It seems like a mystery for the sake of mystery and nothing else. For the record, I believe it's very likely that Ashara's stillborn daughter was indeed Ned's. It would be a pretty ironic twist of fate. We assume that Ned never cheated on Kat, but the reality being that even the ever honorable Ned indeed had a child with Ashara, abandoned her and that led to her suicide, would do a lot to recontextualize this character. Another possible candidate for Danny's potential father is Regar, with either Lyanna, Ashara, or someone else being her mother. What helps is that Danny is constantly compared to Regar. If we assume Lyanna, then John and Danny would actually be twins rather than an aunt and a nephew. Here, genetics would be even funkier than in the case of a Stark Dane union. Even if we assume that in universe genetics do not work the way it does in our world, it would still be pretty peculiar for twins to have such drastically different appearances, with John looking entirely like Lyanna, while Danny looking entirely like Regar. And Ned's illogical actions apply here as well. Why take John to Winterfell, while allowing Danny to be exiled and henceforth doing nothing to ensure her well-being and safety? Danny's features are undeniably Targaryen, so fostering her in Winterfell or among his bannermen would be impossible. But still, they were ways he could ensure her safety in Essos. Assuming that Danny is the daughter of Rhaegar and Ashara has even more glaring holes. Rhaegar never expressed interest in Ashara, and him making it to Starfall from the Tower of Joy just to have a one-night stand with her would be bizarre, as is him having sex with a random girl and having another kid just because. In spite of what the fandom claims, Rhaegar was a dutiful person, and the only time he went against his duties was for the sake of Lyanna. Again, Ockham's razor. What does it add to the plot and the overall narrative, other than convoluting an already convoluted story?
Something that makes the most sense logistically would be that Danny is simply a Valerian-looking girl who, for whatever reason, replaced the true Daenerys. Given that Lysenia are ethnically Valerian and the men still possess Valerian features, she could hail from there. We know that Aaron Bright Flame was exiled in Lys and possibly fathered children there, so she could be his descendant. But this once again begs the question of what would be the point of all this. In Viserys' eyes, Dany is a hindrance more than anything, even if she is indeed his sister, so he would be far less inclined to take care of a random Lysani girl than his actual blood sister. And Viserys must have been aware that this isn't really Daenerys. If, for whatever reason, his real sister died, he must have been aware that she was replaced by someone else. He was eight when he was exiled, old enough to recognize what happened. Viserys was very impulsive as well, and would abuse Dany at any pretext, yet never once even hinted at her being fake during arguments. It also could be that Dany is Aerys' illegitimate child, since he was known to take many lovers during his reign. While at some point he vowed to remain faithful to Rayella, he could have given in to his desires later. And that of course begs the question, what is the point? Why lie about Rayla's daughter surviving and all that? How does it add up to this story in any way? If we assume that Dani is not a Targaryen after all, then we have to address yet another question. How was she able to hatch dragons and mount dragon without being killed by him? Even Targaryens about whom we have no doubt were Targaryens failed at that task, for example Aegon V, who did not bring dragons back in Summerhall and instead accidentally killed most of his family. We know that during the Dance of the Dragons, Jace was in search of dragon seeds, bastards of Targaryen origin who could claim the unwritten dragons. Most people failed in this task, getting burned or even killed by the dragons, and that includes even those who undeniably had Valyrian heritage, not to mention those who did not. Four people in total succeeded. Hugh Hammer and Ulf the White's heritage was not specified, but both of them were born on Dragonstone, where it's safe to assume that they indeed could be the product of the right of the first knight several generations back. Alan failed to claim any dragon, but his brother Adam of Hull claimed sea smoke. While he was officially recognized as Laenor's bastard, the truth is that he was probably Corlysus, since Laenor was gay. The Velaryons hail from Valyria, and even though they were not dragon riders, they nonetheless have the blood of the dragon. Additionally, Corlys himself does have Targaryen heritage, so it's not implausible that Adam was able to climb sea smoke thanks to this. The case most puzzling is that of Netlas, who was able to successfully bond with Shipstealer. She did not have any Valyrian features and was a homeless girl from Driftmark. That means she could have Velaryon heritage. But the relations between Nettles and Daemon were commonly described as something akin to a daughter and a father, so it's possible that the girl was, in fact, Daemon's illegitimate daughter, and Daemon is obviously a Targaryen. Nettles was not the only person of Valyrian heritage to not have Valyrian features either. Thus far, almost all cases of dragon-dragon rider bond have been between people who were likely of Valyrian descent. If Dany is a random dragon seed from Lys or a Targaryen bastard, then there's no problem. But if she's a Dane, like most of the theories claim, then how come she was able to wake the dragons from stone? The Danes are not officially Valerians, and per George, their traits do not necessarily mean they have this descent. And not only that, but most dragon seeds were killed while trying to mount their dragons, even those with Valerian heritage. And yet when Daenerys tames Drogon in Daznak's pit, she survives and is mostly unharmed. While Targaryens are not immune to fire and Dany does burn, she does not burn as much as she should. Dany is also a dragon dreamer, a trait possessed by Targaryens. She dreamt of Dragon before he existed. So how would all of this be possible if she's not a Targaryen in any way? Let us for a while abandon sacred parentage theories and instead focus on the location and its significance. Where are the possible places in which the house with the red door stood? Broadly, there are three that make the most sense. First is Dorne. It could be that Daenerys and Viserys were initially hidden in Dorne, but for security reasons they had to flee. Lemon trees certainly grow there. But for Doran Martel, an extremely cautious man, to all of the Targaryen heirs to stay within his kingdom would be very risky, with little possible rewards. 
When Doran reveals his master plan to Ariane, he never mentions that Viserys and Danny lived in Dorne for a while. Wouldn't this be the best moment to reveal it? Of course, saying this out loud would be risky given that the Varys' informers are probably present in Dorne, but Doran has just revealed that he plans a coup d'etat to depose the Lannisters. So why not include that crucial information as well? The second possibility is Tyrosh. The pre-published version of A Game of Thrones had the House of the Red Door be in Tyrosh. After establishing the secret marriage pact, Doran wanted Ariane to be fostered in Tyrosh, so that she can meet Viserys there. Tyrosh was also a place where Blackfires had a strong presence. Daemon Blackfire married Rohan of Tyrosh and had lots of kids with her. Aegon Rivers and his supporters were exiled precisely to Tyrosh. Aegon, son of Sarah and Illyrio, claims to dye his hair blue in honor of his Tyroshi mother. And most crucially, Danny speaks Valyrian with a Tyroshi accent, so it would make sense that she acquired it there. If the house with the red door was in Tyrosh, then Danny returning there and finding the house with the red door would most probably be connected to finding out about the Mammer's dragon, given the strong presence of Blackfires there. The fact that Egon was pretending to be a son of a Tyroshi lady would be another huge hint. Some people also theorize that Danny is actually a Blackfire, but it poses exactly the same questions as a baby swap with a random Lysani girl. Why would Danny be switched in the first place and pretended to be someone she is not, and how come Viserys never realized this? And if he did, why did he never as much as imply it? And why was he willing to take care of a girl from an enemy branch of House Targaryen? If she is a Blackfire, then the most probable parentage of hers would be Illyrio and Sera, with her being Aegon's sister. But in that case, why didn't Illyrio make sure that Danny is taken care of as well as Aegon was? And even if she is from a different Blackfire line and the purpose of it all was to have two Blackfires pose as Targaryens united in marriage, why was Danny allowed to be homeless while Aegon was protected and educated? There is a third possibility, that the house was indeed in Bravos. But how could it be if George said that the discrepancy matters? What did not point to the house being in a different place? Well, it would be the case if you weren't told that trees don't grow in Bravos, aside from the gardens of the wealthy. This isn't the case only in Bravos either. Winterfell is able to grow fruit even in the harsh north, since they have greenhouses. House of the Dragon, while only an adaptation and not canon to this story, has a very interesting detail in one of the scenes in episode 5, during the conversation between Laris and Alicent. An outsider among the natives. Lord Laris? No valleys, rare bloom, indigenous to Bravos. Yeah, by all rights. It shouldn't be thriving here. This comment is, of course, a meta commentary about Alicent herself. But curiously, in the background, there is a mural on the wall depicting a lemon tree. It could be a coincidence, but it's strange that it's a lemon tree of all things, especially when coupled with Laris's comment. Could it be that it's a nod towards Lemongate? These words could apply not only to Alicent, but also to Dani herself. After all, Danny is an outsider among the natives in Meereen. A rare bloom of this plant could also point to the fact that lemon trees should not bear fruit in Bravos, but they did in the house with the red door. Or it's just a coincidence and does not matter in the slightest. If the house with the red door is indeed in Bravos, then Danny and Viserys couldn't have lived in just a regular house. It must have been a house that could not only have trees, but trees that produce fruit that only grows in warmer climates. The person that could afford this has to be someone exceptionally wealthy, with the most probable candidate being the Sealord of Bravos, the leader of the city himself. From Sirio Forel we learn that the Sealord has a menagerie, and when Dani visits the vision of the house with the red door in the house of the Undying, she notes great wooden beams with carved animal faces, a decoration that's surely a nod to the menagerie. And guess what? The official map of Bravos shows that the Sealord indeed has a lush garden. When Elisa Farman stole Reyna's dragon eggs, rumor has it that she sold them to the Sea Lord of Bravos. This almost caused a diplomatic crisis, which was luckily averted. There are hints that these eggs are the same ones Dani received as her wedding gift, 
though Illyrio claims that he bought them from Ashai. This is either a retcon, or the Sea Lord indeed passed the eggs to Ashai before they were bought by Illyrio. But if these eggs remained in the Sea Lord's possession, wouldn't it be interesting if Dany was in their proximity before? Most crucially though, the Sea Lord of Bravos witnessed the secret marriage pact signed between Oberyn and Willem Dary that betrothed Viserys and Arianna. The pact was most likely signed in the house with the Red Door. In that case, I mainly see two reasons why it's relevant that it was the Sea Lord who hosted Dane and Viserys. Since he is the ruler of Bravos, that place will become narratively important in Dane's story once more. After all, they are a city built by runaway slaves and Dane is currently smashing the continent-wide institution of slavery. Dane's character stands in conflict with the Bravos' idea of Valeria and dragons. They associate them with the horrors inflicted upon them in Valeria, but Dany defies those expectations. Perhaps they may want to aid her in the campaign, especially since they previously made efforts to end slavery in other SOC cities. Perhaps the Sea Lord will reveal the exact origin of Dany's ex. Or perhaps there is more to the secret marriage pact that we know presently. <laughs> Going back to trees in Bravos, it is worth noting that only a Game of Thrones and a Clash of Kings mention the lemon tree in the context of the house with the red door. Later on, when the nurse thinks of that place, the lemon tree is not mentioned. We also don't learn that Bravos is cold and foggy until the fourth installment, A Feast for Crows, where once again we are told that no trees grow in Bravos aside from the gardens of the wealthy. Aside from trees in Bravos, there are various other inconsistencies in Dana's recollection of her childhood that are used to further Lemongate. These are collectively referred to as a page of lies, since most of these details occur on a single page in Dana's first chapter. Before we discuss it in detail, there is something important that must be brought up. Aesoya fandom tends to assume that George R. R. Martin is some omniscient god that cannot make mistakes, inconsistencies or overlook various details. They assume that each and every one of those is secretly or narratively important. The long time with no new book inclined them to scan the books in search of them. They tend to analyze these inconsistencies from the Watsonian point of view, but many of them can easily be dismissed when we look at things from a Doyle's point of view. These concepts were named after Arthur Conan Doyle, the legendary author of the Sherlock Holmes stories, and the character that appears in these stories, John Watson. Since Watson is a character that appears in the story, Watsonian analysis is the in-universe explanation of events. Doyle, however, was a real human being who wrote these stories, and as such, Doyle's analysis is an out-of-universe explanation of events. In short, Watsonian analysis functions within the logic of the narrative, while Doyle's analysis considers the work as a created object, preferring explanations using the author's intentions. For example, in Doyle's The Final Problem, Sherlock Holmes dies during a duel with his arch-nemesis, Professor Moriarty. Doyle intended this to be the definitive end of this character. But the stories proved so popular that Doyle was convinced to bring Sherlock back to life and write more of his adventures. As such, he made him survive by using his brother's oxygen inhaler and went on to write more stories. The Watsonian reason for why Sherlock survived is because of the oxygen inhaler. The Doyle's reason for why Sherlock survived is because Doyle was requested to write more stories featuring him. The work of fiction does not exist in a bubble and Doyle's analysis is often just as important as the Watsonian one. It can be easily applied to many ecosystems in a Zoya itself. Let's take an example of Egon Blackfire. Many people wonder why didn't Illyrio introduce Egon and Daenerys to each other, had them marry earlier and invade Westeros together, instead letting her be homeless and then selling her to Drogo. The Watsonian explanation would be that Illyrio considered Dany a collateral, expecting her to die, with Viserys joining Aegon later with the Dothraki anyway. Or that he wanted to get rid of Dany and Viserys to clear Aegon's path. Or that he wanted Viserys to be an evil uncle, leading a foreign horde in Aegon's perfect homecoming story. The Doyle's explanation is much simpler. By the time of writing A Game of Thrones, young Griff's plot did not yet exist, so Daenerys couldn't have been introduced to him. Simple as. 
Most of these supposed inconsistencies that are hyped up as something significant are easily explained by Dolly's reasons. Even the most meticulously planned books are not free of inconsistencies and plot holes. Besides, George R. R. Martin often speaks about his writing style and it all but cements these assumptions. I think there are two types of writers, the architects and the gardeners. The architects plan everything ahead of time, like an architect building a house. They know how many rooms are going to be in the house, what kind of roof they're going to have, where the wires are going to run, what kind of plumbing there's going to be. They have the whole thing designated and blueprinted out before they even nail the first board up. The gardeners dig up a hole, drop in a seed and water it. They kind of know what seed it is. They know if they planted a fantasy seed or a mystery seed or whatever. But as the plant comes up and they water it, they don't know how many branches it's going to have. They find out as it grows, and I'm much more of a gardener than an architect. When new ideas arise, new information about world building is added, and as such, some of the things in previous installments might become illogical or contradictory. I know this is difficult to salvage, since fans tend to assume Martin to be some godlike figure that cannot make mistakes, but he is a human being like you and me. He sometimes mixes stuff up and forgets things, even important ones. He is quite bad at math too, given the absolutely insane sizes of some objects in Westeros. I mean, Castle Rock is almost as tall as Burj Khalifa. Even with an army of meticulous editors, mistakes can sneak in, especially since A Song of Ice and Fire is such a gigantic story. The whole thing was initially supposed to be a trilogy, but due to George's writing style, he expanded it to seven. Of course, some things from previous installments won't make sense, and since A Game of Thrones is the very first book, such mistakes are the most likely to happen there. Some plots are underdeveloped, not properly thought of, or not even conceived. An example of a similar early inconsistency is that Jaime is supposed to inherit the title of the Warden of the West as Tywin's oldest son, even though later on we learn that, as a member of the Kingsguard, he's well to hold no land or titles. Is this a sign that Jaime is not Jaime or that he has a secret twin that's also named Jaime? No, of course not. In any case, most of the issues brought by the Page of Lies can be explained in the Watsonian way. Nobody remembers or talks about the storm during which Dani was born. Daenerys gets her famous moniker because she was born during the worst storm in the history of Westeros. Yet for such a significant event, nobody seems to bring the storm up or discuss it during the current timeline. And honestly, why would they? Such disasters are usually hot topics during their immediate aftermath, and they are usually forgotten about in a while. Why would anyone randomly bring up a storm that happened 13 years before? If you experience some terrible storms in your life, how often do you discuss them? The only time I do that sort of thing is when there's another storm and me and my family say, oh, this is nothing, remember that storm several years back? A storm isn't some crazy occurrence either. Say, if Danny was born during an earthquake, a tornado or a tsunami, which would be unusual in Westeros, then it would be strange that nobody discusses it. But this was just a really bad storm, not even followed by a flood or any other disaster. This storm is also significant because it destroyed the Targaryen fleet, which, up to this point, was defending Dragonstone from Robert's forces. After it was gone, the children had to be smuggled across the narrow sea to survive. There is a scene in A Feast for Crows where acolytes of the Citadel discuss Daenerys and reference her moniker. Certainly, if there was no storm, now would be a good moment to bring it up and for those guys to wonder, why is she even named that? I don't remember any storm. Rayella managed to give birth after numerous problems without the maester's help, yet somehow she gave birth to a healthy daughter on Dragonstone. I call bullshit. Indeed, Rayella and Aerys' marriage was, among other things, plagued by problems related to fertility. After they had Rhaegar, Rayella suffered several miscarriages, stillbirths and children that died in the cradle. This is what kickstarted Aerys' paranoia. After the birth of Viserys, he often undertook ridiculous actions to defend the safety of the child, which nonetheless culminated in him growing up into adulthood without any problems. The assertion that Rayella could not have given birth to a healthy child because she did not have a maester is, 
frankly ridiculous because it was likely the maesters that caused Rayla's miscarriages, stillbirths and bad children. We see the same happen to Queen Emma Arryn with her suspicious pregnancy problems happening right as the high towers were expanding at court and the king had no male heir. It is not uncommon for Targaryen women to experience miscarriages and stillbirths, but the sheer scale of it in the cases of Rayella and Emma are certainly suspicious, especially given the convenient timing. In the case of Emma, it was happening when Viserys had no male heir, and Emma indeed died without giving him one, the last child of theirs, a boy, following her to the grave, only for his second wife, a high tower, to give him three sons in rapid succession. In the case of Rayella, Rhaegar's birth happened right after the tragedy in Summerhall, where the numbers of the Targaryen family were greatly reduced. Considering that the maesters worked tirelessly to get rid of the Targaryens, and after the tragedy of Summerhall, they have gotten the closest to their goal since the dance, Rhaella not having a maester on Dragonstone, or having a maester who was loyal to her the way Gerardris was loyal to Rhaenyra, was an advantage that ultimately allowed her to give birth to a healthy child. And Rhaella's pregnancy with Danny was not free of problems either. May I remind you, she died. Bravo skates the Valyrians, why would they host them and let them return at least once? Lemon Gate theories became prominent before the release of Fire and Blood, so I don't hold it against its creators that they don't know about some of the things that the book revealed. While the Bravosi did hate dragons and hated Valyria, the relations between the reigning Targaryens and Bravos were neutral even when dragons were still around. The Sea Lord's son attended a wedding between Alyssa Velaryon and Rogar Baratheon. When Elisa Farman stole the dragon eggs and supposedly gave them to the Sea Lord, there had been tensions, but they were easily resolved. Lena Velaryon was betrothed to the son of the Sea Lord of Bravos, in spite of being a Valyrian and a dragon rider of literally the biggest dragon in the world. After the dance, there was a threat of war between Westeros and Bravos, but it was resolved just as easily as the issue of eggs. Aegon IV Targaryen was sent on a diplomatic mission to Bravos and wasn't expelled or treated inhospitably or badly. Most crucially, the secret marriage pact between Arianne and Viserys was conducted with the Sidort of Bravos as a witness, likely in his own house. If there have been tensions between Bravos and the Targaryens, they were mostly due to opposing interests, rather than the blood feuds going back to Valeria. Bravos hated Valeria and dragons due to slavery, which the Targaryens no longer practice after they took control of Westeros. And anyone who predicts Dany to go into conflict with Bravos due to their hatred of dragons conveniently forgets that Dany uses dragons to free slaves, something that the Bravosi should see as inspiring. Besides, the Tyrashi also were not fond of the Valerians, since they killed all the dragons and Valerians who were in Tyrosh at the time of the Doom. So by that logic, the Tyroshi should not allow the Blackfire exiles in and they should not agree to host Danny and Viserys. Timelines don't add up. There is a minor discrepancy related to the birth of Danny and John. One of the Lemongate theorists pointed out that according to the entry in Soulspake Martin, John is 8, 9 months older than Danny, but because Danny was born 9 months after the sack, the timeline of the events does not make perfect sense and it would make more sense for him to actually be 5-6 months older. I searched for the excerpt he seems to be referencing. It was a correspondence with a fan who tried to establish the definitive timeline and Martin himself says that it was 8-9 months. But in the same excerpt he admits that he has problems with timelines and they don't always add up, just like he has problems with other more mathematical aspects of the story. So it's far more likely that George simply got it wrong, rather than it being some big convoluted conspiracy to point out Danny's secret parentage. William Darry is not William Darry. Many insinuate that the man Danny knows as William Darry was not in fact William Darry. The leading clue regarding this is that Daenerys remembers him having soft hands, while Darry was a man at arms in King's Landing. Thus, his hands should be calloused, since he worked with swords his entire life. Crucially, we don't learn that Dari was a master at arms until a storm of sorts, with the word of ice and fire placing the exact timeline of his appointment during Aerys's reign. Again, Doyleist analysis. Not every contradiction is secretly important. And let us once again apply Ockham's razor. Why would Willem Dari not be Willem Dari? Why would Viserys either believe him to be Willem Dari or lie to Danny that this was him? What would be the significance of all this? Why would the man claiming to be Dari even do this? 
The Daris are staunch Targaryen loyalists. Him being the one to smuggle the children across the water makes sense. Who else could it be and for what reason? Just to add a clue to Danny misremembering things? Or maybe when Dari was initially envisioned, he was not a master at arms and only became one in a storm of swords, years after Martin wrote that he had soft hands. Mind you, according to George, he often forgets details about his own characters and relies on his associates, Elio and Linda, to remind him of them. Maybe, just maybe, he simply made a mistake. Or maybe Dari's hands, after no longer being around swords due to illness and age, simply softened. Lemon Gate's popularity is mostly due to how convenient it is. Firstly, if we go by the version of Dany is not really a Targaryen, then that takes away her claim for the throne, clearing the path for Jon, Young Griff or whomever else. Ironically, many fans insist that Rhaegar and Lyanna were secretly married and that Jon is legitimate and a true heir to the throne, even though it's close to impossible to be the case. While their eagle eyes will find any inconsistency in Danny's storyline, they are more than willing to overlook that in order for Rhaegar to annul his marriage to Elia, both of them would have to petition the High Septon and give good reasons. And the annulment would most likely not be granted anyway, since they have heirs. They are also more than willing to overlook that no Septon would be willing to officiate a marriage between Rhaegar and Lyanna. Firstly, because it would be impossible to annul the marriage to Elia as established before. Secondly, because polygamy is not recognized in Westeros by the Fate of the Seven, to which the crown is blinded to, even in the case of the Targaryens after the Conqueror's trio, as seen with Maegor. And thirdly, because Lyanna is betrothed to Robert. The same people who believe that a lemon tree existing is proof of Lyanna's illegitimacy think that Rhaegar somehow did for the chess on everyone and managed to marry Lyanna in spite of all this. The case of Young Griff is even more wonky. All signs point out to him being a Blackfire, son of Sarah and Ilerio, but many fans insist that he is actually the miraculously surviving son of Elia and Rhaegar, or that at least we won't ever find out the truth for certain. The story of his survival makes much less sense than Danny remembering a lemon tree, nobody talking about the storm or Will and Dari having soft hands. Because the story of Egon's survival only makes sense retroactively and has far more inconsistencies in it than whatever happened in Danny's childhood. If Dany's storyline involves a random newborn killed in her place and her being magically smuggled out, then the Lemon Gate theorists would have a field day. But when it's the case of Aegon, then for the sake of him being the true heir and an obstacle for Daenerys, everything can be shrugged off, no matter how ridiculous or inconsistent. Aegon also has another obstacle that Daenerys doesn't. His storyline was explained in the fifth installment of the story rather than the first, so the world building was already in place and George had a much smaller likelihood of making a mistake with regards to him. And apparently, the Mammer's Dragon, Clove Dragon and Dragon's True and False mean nothing. Both Young Griff fans and Jon Snow fans forget one crucial thing though. Even if Jon was magically legitimate and even if Young Griff was who he says he is, Regal's line was disinherited. After he died on the trident, Aerys named Viserys as his heir, and Viserys was later crowned by Rhaella on Dragonstone. Daenerys was Viserys' heir as Princess of Dragonstone, and reminds one, since Viserys has no legitimate heirs. While Westeros has a habit of overlooking female heirs even if the law favors them, Dany has dragons, while they don't, and the Westerosi lords would be highly suspicious of Jon's claims of being Lyanna and Rhaegar's son. Since everyone involved is dead, and Aegon is considered a fake by just about everyone he encounters, with even his mentor having his doubts. The only guarantee to his identity is Daenerys herself and her dragons, but he left for Westeros without her. Clearing the path for male heroes to take away Daenerys' claim to the throne is probably the most significant reason why Lemongate is so widely believed, especially the Daenerys Dane or Daenerys is illegitimate ones. As a Dane or a bastard, she has no claim and her importance to that plot is diminished. Dany not being Daenerys Targaryen also takes away her significance as the last Targaryen, bestowing that title to Jon or Young Griff instead. This functions in much the same way as the claim to the throne. Her illegitimacy or lack of Targaryen heritage makes it easier for Jon or Young Griff to claim the throne and get rid of her threatening their importance, more so in the case of Jon, since he is a much more prominent character than Aegon. 
Dany not being a Targaryen with John being one makes it easier for John to take away her dragons for himself, get these wrong for himself, or get any preferred ending at Dany's expense, with her casted aside. Dany not being a Targaryen and not being the child of Aerys and Rhaella also undermined the possibility of her being the prince that was promised or Azor High. The Targaryen prophecy specifically states that the prince will be a Targaryen. If she's not a Targaryen, then she cannot be the prophesied hero. And if she's not a Targaryen, she would have trouble controlling her dragons and those could conveniently go to someone else. And if she's not the daughter of Rhaella or Aerys, then she also can't be the prince, since the Woods Witch predicted that the prince shall come from their line. Dany not being a Targaryen or being illegitimate is often used as a building block to her downfall and madness. Learning that she's not really a Targaryen and that her identity was built on lies or that she's illegitimate would certainly help kickstart that madness. In that case, often fans want to have their cake and eat it too, because many of these theories involve her not having Targaryen heritage at all, yet somehow possessing Targaryen madness anyway. Lemongate also shows clear as day that people's hatred of Targaryens stems from hatred of Dany, because even those who supposedly hate the Targaryens and stand John as a Stark usually predict him to become a dragon rider, speculate about him wielding Dark Sister, think of Targaryen names for him or hail him as the true heir to the throne, a claim that comes from Rhaegar, whom they also hate, a throne created by Targaryens, ruling over a state created by Targaryens. The case of Young Griff is similar. The most vehement haters of House Targaryen and Dany herself desperately want him to be real, mostly because they love Elia or Stan House Martell. But crucially, Egon himself never references his Martell heritage, nor does he mention Elia, only even talking about himself as the only dragon you need and Rhaegar's son. In any case, Egon would ascend the throne as a Targaryen, with a claim coming from his Targaryen father. His children would be Targaryens as well, and his ascension would cause Targaryen restoration. Many also predict him to take one of Dany's dragons for himself. Why? I thought that dragons are nuclear weapons that genocided Dorne. Why would they want their martel prince to wield one? If they hate the Targaryens so much, why do they want him to succeed so badly? Did the head cannons blind them that much? For the fandom that talks about blood purity so much, it seems peculiar that they seem to believe that Egon's supposed martel genes and John's Stark genes cancel out all of the negative traits of House Targaryen. Dany is a Targaryen on both sides, while John is a son of Lyanna and Young Griff is a son of Elia. As such, John and Young Griff get all the benefits of being Targaryens, while Dany is left with all the disadvantages and all the stigma. John is actually far more violent than Dany. He lashes out at Benjen, bullies other recruits, jumps at Alistair Thorne with a knife, threatens Rust with death, should he harm Sam, all in the first book. If Dany acted like this, it would be fuel to her Mad Queen storyline. In A Dance with Dragons, John has no problems torturing Kragan Karstark with extreme cold in the ice cells, beheads Janos Slint for not following an order, and takes child hostages. Dany also does these things. She has the wine cellar's daughters tortured in order to learn who killed Star Wars Shield and takes child hostages. But Dany never executes anyone for not following orders, puts a stop to the torture once she does, not gain anything from it, and only Dany refuses to harm the children, agonizing over the prospect. And somehow only Dany is frequently scrutinized for this and predicted to go mad on that basis, even though John is the Mad King's grandson and has his mad genes as well. Like I said, John gets all the advantages of being a Targaryen, while Dany is left with all the stigma, even if Lemon Gay theories claim her to not be a Targaryen after all. The case of Young Griff makes this precedent all that more apparent. For one, John is actually a main character, a member of the Key Five, while he is nothing but a side character we barely got to meet. Yet because he is presented as a perfect prince and a fantastic future ruler by his kingmakers, all other negative aspects of his character are overlooked. For how little we knew him, Egon already threw a temper tantrum because he lost the board game and was ungrateful to someone who saved his life. He also got directly compared to Joffrey and impulsively followed Tyrion's advice. Per John Con's words, the moment they land in Westeros, he becomes not as bedouble as he used to be. He openly boasts about being the only dragon anyone needs. If Daenerys acted like this, then the issue of her Mad Queen storyline would have been considered settled. Aegon, on the other hand, is considered a perfect prince, is stunned by people who hate the Targaryens, and many even predict him to get a dragon. 
Once more, Egon gets all the benefits of being a Targaryen at the expense of Danny, who gets all the drawbacks. And this is the crux of all the Lemongate theories. Even in the case of world beneath discrepancies, fans are enthusiastic to search for them in Danny's chapters, while bending the established rules of the universe or logic itself to hype Egon or Jon. The goal of Lemongate is to have Danny removed either by denying her a claim to the Iron Throne, making her go mad once she learns of her secret identity, even if she's a Dane, does not have in Targaryen madness, reducing her importance as the last Targaryen, or denying her the possibility of being a Zora High. <laughs> The issue of the House with the Red Door is likely an oversight on behalf of George R. R. Martin that he tries to make narratively important as a retcon. The most probable location of the House with the Red Door is the Sea Lord's Palace. Most inconsistencies in Dan's storyline can be explained by Doyle's reasons, such as the world building not being properly developed by the time of A Game of Thrones, or some plot lines not yet existing. The same scrutiny is never applied to other inconsistencies in the story either. The reason for such a state of things is because most Lemongate theories end up diminishing Danny's importance and removing her from the narrative. Nothing else. Thanks for watching. Remember that if you like my content, like, subscribe and share so that more people can see it. Make sure to click the notification button so that you never miss a new video. <laughs>